And they could not answer him to these things. And he spoke a parable also to them. When thou art invited to a wedding. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As promised, our sermon today is once again dedicated to deepening our understanding, our appreciation of holy matrimony. As the Council of Trent told us, holy matrimony is a holy thing and is to be treated in a holy manner. We're trying to fulfill those words. Now, last time, we employed a little analogy between the laws of nature and the natural law written on the heart of man to help us understand what is going on. The laws of nature, things such as the gravity that we experience when jumping out of an airplane or the principles of buoyancy experienced in scuba diving, teach us that nature is made by God in a certain way. If we abide by the rules of nature, we will not easily get hurt or hurt others. If, however, we violate them, someone will get hurt. We've all experienced this in our life. That's why we have band-aids. That's why we have hospitals. That's why we have insurance. In an analogous way, the same holds for the moral law of nature that is written in the heart of man and revealed and summarized by God in the Ten Commandments. Written even on stone. In other words, these don't change. They will remain. Until the end. No evolution here. They're not going to evolve. They're written on stone. These are ordinances of reason. They are intelligible. They're rational. And they're able to be followed. If we do not abide by them, nature takes its course and people offend God, their creator and suffer much harm themselves as well as hurting others, it's inescapable. It happens once again. That's why we have confession, a supernatural hospital. Now, since impurity of the flesh brings moral blindness, this natural law is often obscured and considered perplexing, inaccessible, and even incomprehensible to those who wallow in unbridled luxury. Our Lady of Good Success said three centuries ago that in these our times, the spirit of impurity will saturate the atmosphere like a filthy ocean. It will run through the streets, the squares, and public places with an astonishing liberty. Hmm, words of Our Lady, prophecy that's been fulfilled. It ought to be clear to all of us that this is the social media. Airwaves that are filled with impure images and actions. Images and actions that are accessible to nearly everyone worldwide. All you need is a computer, an iPhone, And it causes much filth to pile up on the heart of man, making the natural law seemingly inaccessible. Now, the Roman Catechism, Catechism of the Council of Trent, verifies that such sensory inputs are to be controlled. Quote, But the eyes, in particular, are the inlets of criminal passion. And to this refer these words of our Lord. If thine eye scandalize thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. The prophets also frequently speak to the same effect. I made a covenant with mine eyes, says Job, that I would not so much as think upon a virgin. Finally, there are on record innumerable examples of the evils which have their origin in the indulgence of the eyes. 
It was thus that David sinned with Bathsheba. And thus also that the elders sinned who calumniated Susanna. End quote. The eyes. Inlets to criminal passion. The catechism goes on in another place. Obscene language is also a torch which lights up the worst passions of the young mind. And the apostle has said that evil communications corrupt good manners. Immodest and passionate songs and dances are most productive of the same effect and are therefore cautiously to be avoided. In the same class are to be numbered soft and obscene books, which must be avoided no less than indecent pictures. All such things possess a fatal influence in exciting to unlawful attractions and inflaming the mind of youth. Roman Catechism. With these salutary warnings, what can be said of the social media today? It promotes all of these things and much more. People watch it and act out what they see and hear, and they end up losing their respect and love for virginity, losing their own before they're married, and not surprisingly, failing to remain chaste during marriage. The result is usually a series of divorces and attempts to remarry. Clearly, a major part of the solution is to abstain as much as possible from the social media that is so corrupted and to use the Internet with much protection in place. That was a little review of last time. Today, let's focus our attention on a few lessons history has to teach us about the importance of marriage. Starting at the very beginning. One tradition tells us that Cain and Abel were both fraternal twins. Each had a twin sister. Informed by God, Adam told them that they were to marry their brother's twin. Cain was upset by this as he wanted to marry his own twin. Upset with God for this command, Cain did not worship him properly and did not receive the graces necessary to overcome his decision to kill in order to have his own way. If this tradition be true, the first human blood was shed over a matter touching upon marriage. Hmm. Later, the sons of Seth are said to have lived on the mountain of God. Seth was the third boy of Adam and Eve. He replaced Abel. The sons of Seth are said to have lived on the mountain of God, just below paradise, where they were very happy and living a virtuous life. It was the closest they could get to paradise, which had been closed off to them due to Adam's sin. They could hear the angels chanting in heaven. They were known as the sons of God. At a later time, however, down in the valley, the children of Cain, inspired by demons, according to the tradition, made certain musical instruments. Demons entered into the instruments to help the people play them. For those who know rock and roll, that should sound familiar. Many of them say, something comes over me and enters me when I'm playing my instrument. I can't explain what it is. They made these certain instruments and they're having a sort of carnival down in the valley. Now it happened that some of the sons of God, the children of Seth, heard the music up on the mountain. And many of them came down out of curiosity. And we know the rest of the story from Genesis chapter 6. They left their own wives and they fell in with the daughters of Cain. St. Ephraim explains that it was this falling away of the sons of Seth, the sons of God, that ultimately led everyone to come down from the mountain, the mountain of God, and produce the nearly universal vice that preceded the days of Noah's flood. The whole world was flooded 
over matters touching on marriage. Thus, His Majesty said, In the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, even till that day in which Noah entered into the ark. When Sarah, the wife of Abraham, grew impatient and waiting for God to fulfill his promise of a man-child, she gave her Egyptian slave girl, Hagar, to Abraham to bring forth a son. One came, Ishmael, of whom the Bible states, he shall be a wild man. His hand will be against all men and all men's hands against him. And he shall pitch his tents over against all his brethren. He shall be a wild man. Ishmael is still around. And he's getting more wild than ever. Oh yes, he's still very wild. Many people are dying at the hands of Ishmael. For he is considered one of the fathers of Islam. All this over a matter of marriage that Abraham married a second wife, the slave of Sarah, something not commanded by God. Reuben, Israel's firstborn, lost his position as the eldest due to an act, an impure act, an act against the sixth commandment. The Egyptian-minded Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai worshipped the golden calf. Why did they worship that golden calf? Well, it says it right in the Bible. So that they could rise up and play. A euphemism for debauchery. What was the result? 23,000 people died. David. David's line, his house, received a sword due to his sin with Bathsheba, a sin which led him to lie, to conspire, and to murder. Uriah, her loyal husband. After all that, their baby died anyway. This sword caused divisions that could not be healed until it rested in the sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary. They were of the house of David. Hmm. Remember that next time you see the sword in our Lord's heart, in his mother's heart. This is caused by impurity and infidelity in marriage. David and his sin brought a sword into their house. And it ended in the hearts of Jesus and Mary. Solomon caused wrath to come upon God's people. Deep division. Practices of idolatry. The destruction of the temple he himself made as well as their future exile. All of this was due to his many strange wives. And several of the fathers and mystics of the church say that Solomon was damned. He went to hell for his many strange wives. What of John the Baptist, the great forerunner of our Lord? He died because of a marriage problem, saying to King Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have your brother's wife. That's why they killed him. A marriage problem. In the centuries after the coming of our Lord, we have many amazing examples we could consider, but among them, of course, stands out King Henry VIII of England. Once an obedient son and defender of the Holy Roman Catholic Church against Martin Luther. He conceived in an evil hour a criminal attachment for Anne Boleyn, a lady of the queen's household whom he desired to marry. To make this possible and acceptable to the public, he had to somehow put away his lawful wife, Catherine of Aragon. Seeking the sanctions of the church for an annulment, Pope Clement VII sternly refused to ratify the separation. Though the pontiff could have easily seen, huh? He could have easily foreseen, if he did not, that his determined action would involve the church in persecution 
and a whole nation in an unhappy schism. Pope Clement was proved correct. He was right in his refusal. How do we know that? Well, Henry forced the situation. He quickly had enough, however, of Anne Boleyn. So much for a faithful marriage. And he put her to death not long after their marriage. Something like a thousand days they were married. She did not bring forth the children he wanted. Therefore, you're going on the chopping block. The Pope was right. He was lawfully wed. Now think about it. England went Protestant because of a marriage problem. They kept the Protestant revolution alive even until now, spread its errors all over the world, started wars in various places because of the differences between London and Rome all the while martyring many saints who courageously sought to keep Catholicism alive in England and elsewhere. Cardinal Gibbons wrote, quote, Had the Pope acquiesced in the repudiation of Catherine and in the marriage of Anne Boleyn, England would indeed have been spared to the church, but the church itself would have surrendered her peerless title of Mistress of Truth, end quote. What's the lesson? Simply this. To tinker with the doctrine on marriage is to invite schism, wars, death, not only for some, but for whole nations. What a lesson history teaches us. How important is that marriage bond? There's more at stake than just husband and wife and individuals in a family. When Napoleon applied to Pope Pius VII to annul the marriage which his brother Jerome had contracted with Miss Patterson of Baltimore, the Pope answered him thus, Your Majesty will understand that upon the information thus far received by us, it is not in our power to pronounce a sentence of nullity. We cannot utter a judgment in opposition to the rules of the church. And we could not, without laying aside those rules, decree the invalidity of a union which, according to the word of God, no human power can sunder. Pope Pius VII. Now, it seems to me we need to hear those words over and over again, especially today. The Pope is powerless in laying aside the rules of the church. Can't do it. Now, what does all this tell us? Marriage is the foundation of society with the families they produce as the building blocks of society. This is why marriage is always, always a public institution, not just some private affair. When God created the human race, he began with the marriage of Adam and Eve. When our blessed Lord started his public ministry, he began at a wedding in Cana. Clearly, the future of humanity passes by way of the family, a family whose father and mother are locked in marriage. When a marriage is compromised then, not only will families fall apart, but whole nations will go down. This is the natural law. Speaking. History proves it so. Listen to Pope Benedict XV to Father Matteo during the First World War about that time. He said, The malicious efforts of the wicked are specially directed against the home, the family circle, since the family contains the root, the elements of civil society. The root, the basic elements of civil society, that's the family. Because this is true, he says, the enemies, he's speaking of the communists and the Freemasons here. The enemies realize well that the hoped for transformation or rather the hoped for destruction of all human society cannot take place before the ruin of the family is accomplished. 
Now the saints throughout history teach us what needs to be done. St. Monica, if you've not read our life, please do. St. Monica put up with the unfaithful and difficult Patricius, her husband, the father of St. Augustine. What happened? She remained faithful only to be there for his full deathbed conversion to the Catholic faith and their complete reconciliation. She helped God make a saint. When the 19th century St. Anthony Mary Claret was made bishop of Santiago de Cuba, among the first things he had to do was quell a political revolution. After calming the waters, what did he do to keep the peace and eliminate its underlying causes? High on the list. He set about rectifying all the marriages he could in his diocese, blessing some 9,000 illegitimate unions and mending some 200 broken families. Before returning to Spain to be the queen's confessor, that's his record, 9,000 illegitimate unions and 200 broken families. That's what saints do. They mend according to God's law. Blessed Elizabeth Canori Mora, her husband Christopher demanded she allow him to leave her for another woman. Even after serious threats against life and limb, she fortified by prayer and meditation, rightly refused him. He left her anyway, only to return at her deathbed more than a decade later. In the presence of this woman who had remained faithful to him right to the end, he was overcome by violent remorse for a life full of neglect, ingratitude, and infidelity. And his tears flowed freely. Some years later, he entered into a monastery to make reparation and do penance for the remainder of his life. And he died a holy death 20 years after his blessed wife. Many, many such examples could be found in saint after saint. History has spoken. The church and her saints have maintained course in keeping marriage pure and holy, not giving in under the most intense pressures that the world can produce. They fulfilled the saying of Trent, holy matrimony is a holy thing and ought to be treated in a holy manner. Once again, the lesson of history is simple. To tinker with the doctrine on marriage is to invite schism, wars, death, not only for some, but for whole nations. In the gospel, we heard how those present could not answer our dear Lord and could not understand his ways. They speak for all time, those men. There's always somebody who doesn't understand and cannot answer the doctrines of the church because they're blinded by their sins. What was our Lord's response? It was not to change the teaching to fit fallen man. No, instead he restored marriage to its proper place. In the beginning, God made them male and female. And what God has joined, let no man put asunder. Our Lord's response was to tell man to humble himself. And understanding will follow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.